Beautiful. Okay. Well, welcome to First John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. This is our third lesson in First John. In the first lesson, verses chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we looked at John as an eyewitness of Jesus and also an ear witness of Jesus. He saw, he heard, he touched Jesus, and he's testifying about him. And this whole first half of the of the letter is about Jesus. Uh, but we also looked at the second half of First John, verses 5 through 10, and we saw that that primarily was focused on God as light with a lot of if clauses uh, after that one statement in verse 5. Uh, John basically teaching the disciples how they ought to live. Uh, and of course, verses seven and verse nine are um, two of the most important verses uh, in the letter. Very, very positive verses uh, confirming the identity of the community, the disciples in the community. And so we're going to go on with first John chapter two. Tonight, our goal is to look at verses one through six. And now we're focusing in more particularly, specifically on Jesus. So John is an eyewitness of Jesus, God is light, and now Jesus himself. And he's going to use a couple of very technical words uh, to talk about Jesus here. But in doing so, he's identifying who Jesus is to the community. You're going to see that this is important later on in this very chapter, because there are people either either having left the community and coming back or people trying to enter the community that are saying false things about Jesus. And they're, they're going to be known as the Antichrist, plural. Uh, and so John, before he gets to that in the second half of this chapter, goes ahead and talks about who Jesus is, trying to help people to understand who he is talking about here. And so, yeah, let's let's look at this. Okay, now some scholars would place chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 with the previous section. And they have a right to do that because, as I mentioned on Sunday, uh, these verse dividers and chapter dividers, they are not in the original text at all. In fact, if you were to look at their earliest manuscripts um, of the New Testament, But I'm trying to get, there it goes. Okay, trying to get it to advance. If you look at the earliest manuscripts in the New Testament, then you see that they look like this, but imagine that's Greek lettering there, okay? So it's all capital letters. It has no spacing whatsoever between words, and there is no punctuation at all. And it's just a page like that. No chapter markings, not anything like that. And so the fact that we have chapters and verses today, that's a later addition um, to the text. And so scholars debate where chapters should be and if the guy who originally did that got it right or not. And in this case, some say they don't think he got it right, that this belongs in the previous. I think he did get it right. I think this really works uh, as a chapter divider. And I think it starts a new topic. And this is the topic about Jesus. And even the way he introduces it, my dear children, he hasn't used that before. But I don't know. See if you can read this uh, right there, because that's what you would be working with if you had um, like Codex Alexandrinus in front of you. All capital letters in, in, in the Greek with no spacing, no punctuation. And you see that People who are text critics and put the Bible together, uh, they do good work, and it's not easy work uh, that they do. Um, so I just wanted to to give you a little taste of what what it's like um, trying to live with like a third century manuscript, uh, that type of thing. So um, this is the man right here, uh, Stephanus, born in fifteen fifty one who actually added the chapters and verses into his Bible. He didn't do it until his fourth edition of the text. But in his fourth edition of the New Testament text, um, he added chapter markers and he added verse markers. And we actually owe him a great debt. 
Because how much easier is it to even tonight to say, turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, versus turn to, you know, kind of like um, maybe one-fifth into 1 John, <laughs> and let's see if we can all find the right spot. Uh, having chapters and verses is a really nice thing to help us to study the Bible. Uh, the legend is, is that he placed these chapter and verse markers while he was traveling back from Paris to Lyon on horseback. Uh, and so that's why he may have gotten some of them wrong because maybe uh, the carriage hit a bump or something like that, or the horse the horse um, was in an ill mood or something. Um, however, it's more likely that most of his work happened after he arrived at one place or the other and got off of his horse. Um, in fact, his son kind of says, yeah, the, the, the legend isn't, isn't really um, true. But we owe him a great debt because what a great um, uh, help it is to us today to be able to read the Bible with text markers in it, with chapter markers and verse markers and, um, and that sort of thing. And so we're going to begin here with uh, this verse, and I want to read um, the first six verses right now. And um, then we're going to go on and we'll talk about them here in just a moment. It starts with my dear children, uh, the first five verses, rather. My dear children, I am writing these things so that you will not sin. Um, if anyone sins, we have a helper with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And that's the topic of these first, it's actually six verses right here. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is an atoning sacrifice. There's one of our technical words. For our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Because of this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, that person is a liar and the truth is not in them. Whoever keeps his word, the love of God is truly made complete in them. And this we know that we, by this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he remains in him ought to walk as Jesus walked. I want you to look at these first six verses and, Im and imagine what you're looking at is a descending stairway. And I'm going to have a picture of that in a moment here, because I think that's what's happening here is that John starts off with this beautiful, uh, intimate introduction, calling the readers his children, not just that, but my dear children, or some translate that as my beloved, very intimate way to talk about them. And then introducing Jesus and then getting to the point down in verse six, where he says, we need to walk with Jesus. That's my point is, are we walking with Jesus. And and he, I think he does a beautiful job of descending the stairway to get on this foundation of actually walking in the steps of Jesus. But he begins here with this phrase, my little children. Um, it's not just my children. Uh, it's not, hey, kids. <laughs> it's my little children. That is a very um, endearing way of addressing them. Obviously, it's a very parental way of addressing them. And you get the sense that John, as he addresses this community, or even if it's not John, even if it's a disciple of John, that they have parental care for the community that they're writing. They're writing them as a parent would write a child. In fact, Karen Jobes, a, a biblical scholar, says, this vocative, vocative is just a Greek term that means it's it's a direct address. Like if I were to say to you, um, students, that would be vocative. This vocative establishes his affection for his readers, while yet maintaining his authority to instruct them as someone older and wiser in the faith, and possibly someone who may have directly or indirectly been responsible for their conversion to Christ. I, I like what she's saying there. You know, she's saying it's a, it's a term of endearment, 
draws them in, and yet at the same time, it still establishes a sense of um, a being a parent. I've got I've got something I need to say to you. There's some issues that we need to talk about as a family here, and that's how John writes to his community here. And we've already looked in the first chapter at some things that situational things that came up, and we'll see some more situational things in that community that'll come up in chapter two. Less of these first six verses than following. I mean, in the middle of chapter two, um, there's a big situation. The dealing with the Antichrist is one of the main reasons that John wrote this letter. And we're but we'll learn more about them as we continue to read this and and uh, look at this material together. Um, so he's writing here. It says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And ding, 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 there's the first technical term, this word advocate. What does it mean that, that Jesus is an advocate? We think of Jesus as Christ. We think of Jesus as the righteous one. But you know, how many times do we pray to Jesus, oh, dear Jesus, my advocate? <laughs> I don't think I've ever prayed that. Um, and yet John says, this is one way that we should think of Jesus, that he is our advocate. The word for that is parakletos. Um, in this particular verse, it's parakleton, just a different ending. But it's the same word, parakletos. And the word parakletos is actually unique to John, not just 1 John, but also in John's gospel. In John's gospel, there's a paraclete, which is basically the same word, different ending. And that refers to the Holy Spirit. I'm sure you're aware of that. In John 14, 16 and 26, John 15, 26, John 16, 7, paraclete, thinking of the Holy Spirit, is he is our guide. He is our helper. He is our advocate. But now... Uh, John uses the word uh, to refer to Jesus, and um, this is something that is unique to John's writing in the New Testament, to think of Jesus in this way, or even the Holy Spirit in this way. So what does this word mean? Well, there's a couple of ways to look at it. One, you could say that par that para Kletos is a legal advocate. Um, and so, I don't know, if you, if you like lawyers, then you can say that. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, okay? But he's a, he is a legal advocate. He goes to God on our behalf. And that's one way that you could talk about um, Jesus. He is our advocate to the Father. That's, that's actually a great thought, that he goes on our behalf to the Father. But there are other ways that you could think about that, this term that may be a little less sterile, a little less forensic, a little more touchy-feely, and that is he is our guide, he is our helper, uh, BDAG, which is this big old thick Greek, um, Greek uh, dictionary, I have one right behind me here, um, it translates this, or not translates it, but it says the word is one who is called to another person's aid. And that's what I like. That's that's the that's the definition of this word that I like the most. That who is Jesus? He's one who is called to our aid. And I usually think of the Holy Spirit as my guide. Um and Jesus is too. This word is used of Jesus, but I don't know. Because it's used more. Of the Holy Spirit in that way. And John, I just always have connected that Holy Spirit guide me, Holy Spirit lead me. But I certainly think of Jesus as always coming to my aid. In times of trouble, I call on Jesus. And I find that Jesus is there. Jesus helps me out. Um, he lifts me when I fall. He helps me when I'm lamenting. He's just always there. Um, 
And so I think of the Holy Spirit as, as a constant guide for me in life and Jesus as a constant aid for me in my life. Now, the fact is, is you can think of the Holy Spirit and Jesus in all those terms and in all those ways. And however you want to think of them, that's up to you and whatever helps you the most, go with that. Um, but the main reason I want you to see this term is I want to give you something to meditate on. This is a really good idea to meditate on. Really good idea just to think about. How do I think about Jesus as Perikletos? What does that mean for me? And does it change anything in my relationship um, with him or, or, or does it deepen anything with my relationship with him? Hopefully. And so he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And, but John knows they're going to sin. So he's not saying I'm writing these things to make you perfect because, you know, perfectionism is a, a doctrine that some churches teach, but it's not really a biblical doctrine, perfectionism. Uh, we mature, we grow, but we're always going to have some deficiencies. And so he says, if anyone does sin, knowing that that condition is very well going to happen, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. There's so many times in John where John gives us great affirmations to cling to. And this is another one of those. First John 1 verse 7, it's an awesome one. First John 1 verse 9, fantastic. And First John 2 verse 1, this idea of Jesus going to the Father on our behalf coming to us for our aid or to our aid. That's a beautiful picture, great image to hold on to. And that's what John has to say about Jesus here. So, okay, let's go on to verse two. All right, now we're at verse two. And it says, he is an atoning sacrifice. Ding, ding, ding. There's that other technical term right there. So two out of the gate, Perikletos, and now this one. Hel, um, helasmas, helasmas. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. Another way of saying that is Jesus is our the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for um, the whole of the world, also for the, the sins of the whole world. So Jesus is advocate, parakletos. Jesus is helasmas. He is the atonement, the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation, the expiation. Now, I'm going to get into this just a little bit, hopefully just enough to whet your appetite and to get you to think a little bit and not enough to put you to sleep because <laughs> this is a weighty word right here. Okay, you can see it right there in the English transliteration and in the Greek, helasmas. Helasmas can be translated a number of ways. There are primarily three ways that it's translated. One is propitiation. This is what Karen Jobes has to write about this. Uh, she distinguishes between the two terms writing. Propitiation is something done to win the favor of an of a an you, usually angry God, spirit, or person. Whereas, and here's the second way. It's often defined. Expiation. And you're like, you know, it's difficult when you have words to define a Greek word that you have to define in English. Okay, I get that. That's why I'm saying this is weighty. This is a technical term here, okay? Um, and and the, the translators don't make it easy, and the scholars, honestly, don't make it easy. And one of the reasons they don't make it easy is because it's not easy. It's just, a, this is not one of those slam dunk, I got the meaning of this. It's, you have to really weigh out, okay, what does this mean based on ancient literature? Not so much based on how it's used in the Bible, because it's not used um, very often uh, in the Bible. In fact, I think it is only used here and in chapter 4, verse 10, um, here in in, in, in 
and, and John, and that's it. And so we don't have much to base it on when we just look at the text of the New Testament. We have to go outside of the New Testament. So propitiation is one way of translating it. Expiation is another way. Whereas expiation is directed toward nullifying an offensive act that is set in motion, a train of undesirable events that has caused a breakdown in a relationship. Now, if you look at those two definitions there, what do you see as being different one from the other? Just look at it for a second. Think about it for a second. If you look at the first one, there's this word, angry God. If you look at the second one, there's this idea of breakdown in a relationship. Now, many, many people prefer expiation because there isn't that sense of appeasing an angry God. And there are some people that just cannot even begin to fathom God being an angry God. Even though biblically we know there are texts that talk about God and the different human emotions associated with God, like jealousy, for example. And so they go for expiation because it's more relational. Um, there's a broken, there's a break in a relationship. What does Jesus do? He comes to fix that and to heal that. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus. If there is any anger of God that needs to be appeased, guess what Jesus does? He comes to appease that anger. It's another beautiful picture of who Jesus is. And then there's this third idea associated here, and that's the idea of atonement, atoning sacrifice. And so in another awesome um, <laughs> Greek dictionary, uh, this one's super thick. It's like volume after volume after volume. Um, it says, God himself has provided the means of expiation. Expiation restores the disrupted relationship with God, except where sinners cut themselves off from the community by willful transgression. You note that? It, it's, it heals that relationship, except when sinners don't want it. Then there's nothing that can be done because they're cutting the relationship off. It says, since life is thus saved by life, the idea of vicariousness is undeniably presented in some sense. And that's the third, is vicarious atonement. You might have heard Godin Ferguson. He says, he says this all the time when he talks about atonement. Atonement means at one moment. At one moment, Jesus made things right with God. But it was Jesus that did that. God needed a sacrifice and Jesus stepped in to be that atoning sacrifice. So this idea of vicarious atonement, okay? I know that's a lot of technical stuff, and I'm going to move on from that. I wanted to give it to you because it's there in the text. And I think it's interesting to think about this. Does God's anger need to be appeased? If so, Jesus does that. Is there a relationship that's broken? Well, definitely there, there is. Jesus comes in to mend that relationship. Is there some sacrifice that needs to happen for sin? According to other scriptures, there is. Jesus steps in and does that. And all of this falls within this umbrella term of kalasmos, a really great term that I'm going to ask you about on Sunday. <laughs> so make sure that you know uh, that term. I don't know where I heard first heard this illustration, but I think it's a good illustration um, it might have been N.T. Wright, or it might have been Ed Anton. He talks about this quite often, and maybe Ed Anton actually quoted N.T. Wright, and that's where I heard it. I don't know. But anyway, someone said, one of those guys said, that the best way to think about this term is to, if you know about golf, then you have different clubs in your bag. And if you look at the clubs here on the right-hand side of the screen, those are three wedges, three different size wedges. Back when I used to golf, I used to carry three red wedges. Not that I was good with any of them. I was just as bad with each one. I just thought it was cool to have three wedges in my bag. <laughs> and so I carried three wedges with me in my bag. And um, and I loved them, actually. They were, they're beautiful. I still have them. They're so gorgeous. Um, and I couldn't hit a thing with them. But anyway, it wasn't about that. 
you know, about having three wedges in your bag. And the thing is, each one does something a little different. If you're a little farther away, then you're going to pitch a, hit a different wedge uh, that has a little less loft. Then if you're very next to the green and you pick a, a ledge that has more loft and it'll lift the ball, it'll lift the ball higher in the air, theoretically, <laughs> never worked for me. Theoretically, it'll lift the ball higher in the air. Um, and what what Wright or maybe Ed Anton says is that uh, you, you pick the wedge based on where you are, and the same is the thought with Halasmas based on where you are in the context of the Bible, think about expiation or propitiation or atoning sacrifice. They all work in one way or another based on the context that you're reading in the Bible. And so don't just go for one because, you know, maybe I'll go for propitiation because I don't like that thought of expiation. No, uh, keep all three. And then when you find a certain context in the Bible, Use the one that works best for um, that context. Makes sense? I think it does make sense. Karen Jobes also writes this. If here it is a reference to the whole planet, well, this is about not just saving us, but saving everyone. Some people say that's universalism, that it just saves everybody. God saves everyone. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And she writes, if here it is a reference to the whole planet, the whole cosmos, consideration of the historical context in which John wrote makes a more likely interpretation to be the universal scope of Christ's sacrifice in the sense that no one's race, nationality, or any other trait will keep that person from receiving the full benefit of Christ's sacrifice if and when they come to faith. John asserts that the efficacy of Jesus Christ's sacrifice is valid everywhere, for people everywhere. That is the whole world. The Christian gospel knows no geographic, racial, ethnic, national, or cultural boundaries. Boom. I wish I had written that because that is so well said. The verse isn't teaching a universalism that everyone's going to be saved just because they're human. What it's teaching is that everyone has a chance for salvation because of Jesus, and it doesn't matter where what country they live in, what language they speak, their ethnicity, their background, their economic situation, none of that matters. The gospel is for everyone. And this is the message that John is saying here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Another great verse. Um, this chapter has a lot of really great verses. Okay, let me check my time. I'm doing good. By this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. First John chapter two, and now we are in verse three. Notice it talks about knowledge here, not once, but twice. We know that we have come to know him. How? By keeping his commandments. So there are two things that are important here. First is just knowledge. A big reason why John is writing his letter to help people with knowledge to help people to understand, you have the knowledge to be a mature disciple. There's no reason why you shouldn't be. This is one of the things that my dad helped me with by reading me this book. Steve, why are you questioning that? You know, you know what's right. You know who Jesus is. You have the knowledge. Stop acting like you don't have the knowledge. You have it. And this is what John is saying to his people as well. You know enough. It's a matter of obedience. <laughs> yeah, it's a matter of keeping the commandments. And so don't act like it's knowledge, a knowledge thing. Don't act like you don't know enough because you do know enough. It, it, the, the, the question is, do you want to obey? Are you willing to obey? That's the real question. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that uh, John says, the knowledge is there. I think by knowledge, he know, he means not just intellectual knowledge and not just head knowledge, but experiential knowledge. In the Hebrew, that would be yada. The yada is to know God. It's Yada is experiential knowledge of God. And I think that John has that in mind. Um, but also, it's good to have head knowledge. It's good to have intellectual knowledge. It's good to have 
knowledge of scripture, all these things come together. I'm going to share a dream I had recently. I think it's a rather funny dream, but it was a dream where we were having a very important discussion in class. This was back when I was in college and my college professor was Rubel Shelley, who taught logic and epistemology. And I was in his logic class. Uh, and I don't know if you know Rubel Shelley, but he's a very famous Church of Christ um, uh, professor and also minister and really good also. I've written a lot of books. But anyway, Shelley was posing, how do we know that we know? Um, this whole idea of phenomenology. Dallas Willard was big into that. That was what he wrote his dissertation on. How do we know what we know? Um, how do we know that we can know? That kind of thing. And so we were talking about that and debating that. And John Mark Hicks, many of you might know John Mark Hicks. He wrote a book on um, patternism. And uh, another friend and a colleague and professor at uh, Lipscomb University, he was in that class, uh, not literally in my dream. <laughs> We actually were in the same, uh, he was like, I think two years ahead of me at school and Shelley did teach both of us. So all of that's true. Um, and so they were debating it. And one of them debated about um, uh, intellect and one of them debated about scripture. And then they asked me, they said, okay, Kennard, your turn, get up to the mic and tell us what you have to offer. And so I took my position and my position that was that my knowledge of truth comes from a mystical connection with God. And it's generated by the Holy Spirit. And I understand this through uh, the medium of dreams and um, prompting by the Holy Spirit and dialogue with the Holy Spirit. And <laughs> they had the weirdest look on their faces because that's totally not Freed Arnman College where I went to school. So, um, but I supported my argument, and th th I really did this in my dream. I supported my argument with um, with scriptures from Abraham and Joseph and Daniel and Jesus and Paul and the Apostle John. And I also uh, talked about uh, Francis and Claire of Assisi and Julian of Norwich and uh, Joan of Arc and Teresa of Avilia and St. John of the Cross and Hildegard and Fatima and St. Teresa of Calcutta. And so by the end, after I'd said all these things, they were just like, okay, Kennard, <laughs> uh, the, the, fine, we'll accept what you have to say. Um, and and I, I, my, I don't know, my mystical appeal won the day that day. I do think that knowledge comes to us in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think one of them is a mystical connection with God. I, I really believe in the Holy Spirit. Um, but I think also it's from studying the Bible, and I think it's also from prayer, and I think it's also from learning from other people, and I think it's also learning from life, life experience. So knowledge comes to us in a lot of different ways, and it can also come from what? Keeping his commands. That's what John is saying here. Um, you can know that you know by keeping his commands. You want to know if you know Jesus or not? Just look, hey, how are you doing obeying? That's one sure way to know if you know Jesus or not. Okay, let's look in verses four and five now. Um, it says here, the one saying, I have known him, still talking about knowledge, and is not keeping his commands is a liar. One of the things that you see about John, he doesn't mince words. He just calls it what it is. And he says, you know, if you're saying that and you're not living the life, you're lying. Um, and then he says, and the truth is not in this person. But whoever keeps his word truly in this person, the love of God has been perfected. In this we know that we are in him. So by keeping the word, not only do we have knowledge, but also the love of God is perfected. That's my favorite Greek, Greek, Greek word right there. That's teleos, matured, uh, made mature, become mature, become whole in this person um, by um, keeping his word. The love of God does that. It becomes mature in a person. And this is where I wanted to mention this descending stair step again. Okay. This is some modern art here. I don't, I not only share Bible, I share art with you as well. <laughs> and so, 
you're welcome. You're so welcome. But this is called the descending cat. Isn't that beautiful? It does. I think it is actually. I like the colors of it, especially that beautiful orange. Wow. That kind of reminds me a little bit of Tennessee orange. Yeah. Um, the descending cat. And this is what John is doing in this. He is, it's a, it's a, you can think of it as a stair and you're going down these stairs, verse one, verse two, verses three and four, and verse five, and then boom, you get down to verse six, which I think is the main point. And I think, you know, structure, as I mentioned on Sunday, is important. I think this structure is a descending structure leading to the main point in verse six, which we are about to get to here. But he says, to know Jesus, we must keep his commands. To claim to know Jesus and not keep his commands makes you a liar. You can see the um, intricate way that he builds his argument there. If we keep his word, then the love, then God's love remains in us. And then he says, by this, we will know that we are in him. So all this stuff about knowledge, but whoever he, whoever says he remains in him ought to walk as Jesus walked. And that's verse six. That's where he's really going with all of this. Um, is this idea of walking in Jesus. Let's just jump back for a second to this phrase, God's love, that he uses in these last couple of verses here. God's love can be understood in a number of ways. And what I would like you to do is to spend some time tomorrow, the next day, if you journal, put this in a journal, uh, just thinking about how, how can God's love be understood? I wrote a few ways here. It could be as God's love for me, can be the love who is God, can be the love is God, can be God is love, can be my love for God, it can be God's kind of love, it can be the type of love that God requires. This little phrase, God's love, can be read in a number of different ways. I had a Greek class this morning with a number of students and um, this phrase actually came up and it's, it's, um, it's formed by a genitive. And whenever you have a genitive, you ask, have to ask, how is that genitive being used here? And there's so many, I mean, in our grammar right now, we're looking at like, I think 15 different ways and we have to choose, okay, is it adjectival? Is it adverbial? Is it like a noun? How is it used? Anytime you see something like this, the love of God, God's love, then you, we ask, what is meant there? And I just want us to spend some time meditating on it, asking ourselves, what do we think of when we think of that? Another thing to think about, at a little time for meditation, um, is to cycle through the possible meanings of God's love and then apply them to your own life. This is another good thing to journal about. How am I loved by God? How does God love me? How is God love? How do I love God? The qual what qualitative ways do I love God? What are the qualities of God's love? All of these are good questions just to sit and ponder and think about, thinking about God's love. And John, part of what he's writing here is he's writing about um, the love of God, but whoever keeps his word truly in this person, the love of God has been matured, teleos, made perfect, made whole. Part of our goal as disciples of Jesus is to get God's love in our heart and that love becoming whole in our heart. Now, a little news flash here. This is the first time John uses love in his letter, but love is a major theme in John's writing and in this letter as well. Karen Job's notes, of the 116 times the noun love, agape, occurs in the New Testament, a full quarter are found in John's writing. And more than half of those in John's writing are in 1 John. So that means, that means it's the first time he's used it in chapter two, verse five, but get ready, because this word's about to appear over and over and over and over again, especially in the second half of John because it's one of John's favorite words. Whether it's connected with God or connected with community, John writes a lot about love.
Now let's close out with verse six. And this is where all of this has been headed toward um, verse six here. And it reads, the one who says that he ought to remain in him, just as that one walked or lived, uh, ought this person to walk or live. And so it talks about abiding in Jesus, remaining in Jesus. And if we do, we'll walk in him. Now, walking is a way um, in the New Testament to talk about living your life. When it says walk this way, it's really talking about living this way. Um, and But what John is saying here is after he said all these other things and kind of walked down this staircase, he's now in this foundation of what he wants the group to do, what he wants the community to do. And ultimately, it is be like Jesus, walk like Jesus. And if you abide in Jesus, then you are going to walk in him. Menane um, men, is to abide, to continue. Um, he, it says that the one saying, I'm remaining in him, walk it. Don't just talk it, walk it. Be the person that walks like Jesus walks. Ought is this idea of there's an expectation. We have this expectation of Christians. This is how they should live their life. They should live their life looking like Jesus. And so just as Jesus walked, we ought to walk. Just as Jesus lived, we ought to live. Um, and that one here, I believe, is Jesus. I think that's the person that's referred to the most in this context here. Um also, walking can mean if, uh, to conduct one's life. So walking, living, conducting one's life as Jesus did. I'll close with this. Disciples of Jesus learn to ask, what would Jesus do? And that's not just a platitude, and it's not just initials to put on a bracelet, WWJD. John here in this verse First um, John chapter two verse six is saying, "This is how you ought to live. This is how you ought to be. You ought to ask yourself how how would Jesus do this? What would Jesus do? And you need to learn that way. Disciples learn to think, act, and be like Jesus. This is the core of spiritual formation: becoming like Jesus. This is that word just mentioned, teleos, that wholeness, that maturity." in God's love. It's seen this way in how we live our lives and are we living like Jesus. We allow the Holy Spirit to form Jesus in our lives. Now life is a journey and we can think of it as a long walk. And if we're walking in Jesus, then we're taking the long road with him. As we walk, we choose to follow the footprints of Jesus. We live as Jesus lived, and this is how we remain in him. This is how we could stay connected to the vine. This is closely associated in John's mind with keeping Jesus's word and obeying Jesus's command. We keep the word of Jesus before us as a path where we follow his footprints and we learn to become more and more like him. And as we do this, we all of a sudden find ourselves maturing in God's love and becoming more like Jesus. John sets this up here at the beginning of this chapter because he want, he's going to be talking about people that are trying to draw them away from who Jesus is. And John is saying, do not let anyone do that because when you allow them to do that, they are taking you away from the foundation that's going to cause you to grow. To grow Spiritually, we need Jesus. There you go. And I will stop sharing. And thanks for being here tonight.